Chapter 2 Methodology An Autoethnographic Process Quote, Knowledge can only come by conscious identity, for that is the only true knowledge, existence, aware of itself. Close quote. Sri Aurobindo Methods I carried out ethnographic fieldwork in Orville for this project from July 2017 to May 2018. I spent a significant amount of time as an observer or participant observer of community-wide meetings and those of Orville's working groups, even joining certain administrative groups as a result. I conducted 16 experts and 12 life history interviews with Orovillians and countless other informal conversations. I also participated in numerous celebratory gatherings and performances for the community's 50th anniversary, which fell within the time frame of my fieldwork. Once in the field, I quickly chose to base my research almost exclusively on participant observation for a number of reasons. Interviewing Orovillians is almost always an incredibly rich experience. For me personally, in terms of the deepening of relationships it facilitates with fellow community members I already know, and the opportunity for connection it offers with those I do not, something I had experienced during the course of previous research in Oroville. It also is almost invariably revelatory of spiritual dimensions of experience, understanding and insight that inspire and guide individuals in their commitment to and engagement with the community. As such, conducting interview-based research within Oroville is both emotionally nurturing and spiritually inspiring and would have been wonderful to pursue over the course of my fieldwork. However, because of the richness that they yield, both in terms of process and output, narrative methods are commonly used within Oroville. There is a strong focus on personal stories, especially in our own insider research, and often captured audiovisually. I could certainly have built on what has already been recorded, not only by capturing a further diversity of voices, but by undertaking an analysis of what are currently simply collections of individual stories. Yet, what I observe in our community is that while the depth of individual experiences is easily accessible, Within our community itself, we struggle to understand how we are embodying our ideals at a collective level, something that is a source of frustration, disappointment and distrust. I therefore chose to focus this thesis on my participant observation of our collective forums. My reason for undertaking the research primarily through participant observation is also because I wished to do so as closely as possible as a community member instead of as a researcher. I feel that this was something I could uniquely do as an Oroville. Any researcher can conduct interviews and focus groups, but very few can participate in community life in the way that I could. It was this grassroots experience that I wished to capture and participant observation was clearly the most appropriate research method for this. The exchanges being held in the context of interviews and focus groups cannot but anticipate a certain recorded output. An external audience is undeniably present on the horizon. Furthermore, there is quite a strong shared discourse about Oroville when members communicate about it with an external audience. And this has made it difficult for other researchers 
to arrive at in-depth ethnographic understandings of our community when relying on interview methods. Of course, ethical considerations are paramount for an autoethnographer conducting participant observation. What exchanges are meant for or presumed to include me solely on a personal basis as a community member? I decided I would rely heavily on the sharing of written work for feedback from those involved in generating it to answer this question. A time-consuming task and one that ethnographers rarely recourse to for participant observation. However, I felt this was paramount given my membership in the community. Furthermore, it would allow any concerns from community members related to how I interpreted certain exchanges to be revealed. Elaine Lawless, an ethnographer who suffered misunderstandings upon dissemination of her written work with research participants who had become friends, precisely due to her interpretations of their experiences feeling incongruous to them, recommends that such dialogical processes be facilitated prior to final publication and even featured within it. In my research process, I facilitated such forums of exchange at a much earlier stage even. It was not only my power of interpretation in the analytical stage that I was concerned about, but my power to define the very research agenda of this thesis on our community. I hosted two focus group discussions in Oroville when I was close to finalizing my research outline, in which I shared the draft with participants beforehand and asked them for feedback. Specifically, I asked them what they felt would be the most important aspects of our community to explore within the scope of this project. And these discussions defined the areas of focus of my research, as did certain needs within the community during the course of my fieldwork, which could be met by my participation as a researcher. Situating the autoethnographic nature of my research. Orville is a physical, social, and spiritual community in which I was born and raised and with which I have enduring personal ties and involvement. During the course of my fieldwork, I officially rejoined the community as a member after almost a decade spent living abroad. The ethnographic nature of my research is traditional in that its object of inquiry is a geographically situated society that is delimited from its surroundings by its social organization, values, and membership, something that is no longer common. Anthropology has evolved in our globalized era to study topics such as transnationalism and flexible citizenship, and ethnographic methods are used across disciplines in the social sciences and humanities to explore a wide range of social processes. What is unusual about it, both generally speaking and for research on Orville specifically, is that this ethnography has been undertaken by an insider and is thus autoethnographic or native. The original use of the term autoethnography described research of and in one, one's own group, in which the researcher is a full insider by virtue of being native, acquiring an intimate familiarity with the group or achieving full membership in the group being studied, and thus fully committed to and immersed in the group they study. As such, the researcher is explicitly part of the phenomena under study, a dynamic that can shape methodology, analysis and writing, and which I experienced in all three. 
I wish to highlight this in my thesis, as I believe it can serve to shed some insight into an autoethnographic process, a practice that is still new to many. My doing so will in and of itself be demonstrative of autoethnographic research, in another sense of the term. It has come to define not only research on one's own people, but also reflexive or autobiographical ethnographies, in which researchers intentionally and explicitly examine their role in and personal experiences as part of an ethnographic project and address the significance of this specifically in the process of inquiry, analysis, writing, and any other ink outcomes of the research. My research thus falls within both categories of autoethnography, a study of my own community in which I engage as both a researcher and community member and one in which I intentionally choose to integrate my own personal experience as part of a heuristic research practice that can serve to both illuminate and leverage my embeddedness in the inquiry. I believe this is valuable because I am a product of the society I am researching, and doing so will necessarily be revelatory of the attitudes and values fostered in the Orville context. That said, I would like to emphasize that my personal experience should not be considered as representative of an overarching Orville experience, simply because of my insider status. Many autoethnographers have already problematized the essentialist conceptions of affinity and sameness among members of a group that gave rise to such assumptions. Hayano, who coined the term autoethnography, points out that cultural realities and interpretations of events among individuals in the same group are often highly variable, changing, or contradictory. While I do intend to yield an insider perspective of the Orville community, I strive for it to transcend the boundaries of my personal experience in acknowledgement of the diversity of views and experiences of Aurevillians. Reflexivity and subjectivity. Some are critical of utilizing and exposing reflexivity because the traditional ethnographer is mostly invisible. Their impersonality serving to promote the research endeavor as objective and scientific. However, the pretext of objectivity has been challenged by numerous ethnographers and even in natural scientific research, a fellow doctoral researcher in physics has assured me. While traditional ethnographic accounts may not have always or often included self-reflection, Dumont remarks, the personal has never been subordinate in the private world of field notes. Our own inherent biases as individuals cannot be stripped from the process or production of research. As Oakley states, the specificity and individuality of the observer are ever present. In the face of undeniable subjectivity, reflexivity becomes nothing short of an ethical necessity. The fact that the ethnographer's personal history plays a significant role in enabling or inhibiting certain kinds of analytic insights or oversights is true of any researcher, not only a native one effectively debunking the criticism that autoethnographers cannot conduct research on their own communities on the basis that they are subjective. As if the subjectivity of an external researcher were non-existent, as if they did not observe, inquire, relate, 
analyze and communicate through the lenses of their own backgrounds and experiences. The reflexive turn highlighted and maintains that the relationship between the ethnographer and the community they research influences the generation of knowledge and that the implications of the research for the community must be reflected on and transmitted with self-consciousness on the part of the researcher. Researcher members are likely to be more accountable than non-members in practicing the latter because they, their families and communities will need to live with these implications and can also effectively hold the researcher to account. However, this raises the issue of how critical a native autoethnographer can be of their own community. Some argue that an insider is incapable of having as critical a lens as an outsider because they cannot be objective in their analysis. In Decolonizing Methodologies, Linda Tuhiwai Smith problematizes this bias in favor of external researchers, arguing that it stems from the dominant, rational objective frames of reference of what she refers to as the Western Academy. The attempted invalidation of both indigenous and autoethnographic research, including by fellow community members, is a product of this hegemony. While I recognize that insiders may be prone to oversight or a degree of denial due to overfamiliarity and identification with their community, I do not think it is fair to juxtapose this against an unchallenged superiority of the research that can be conducted by an outsider. Distanciation from the field is critical for researcher members, for both personal and professional reasons, in order to gain a mental perspective or disengage emotionally from the research process. Something noted by the autoethnographic activist anthropologist Marianne Meckelberg. However, the immersive nature of ethnographic fieldwork alone is conducive to any researcher facing such challenges. Furthermore, while an autoethnographer may be as capable of a critique of their own community, or more so, than an external researcher, they may not see the value of doing so for an external audience. Feminist ethnographer Elizabeth Enslin cautions, some events, conflicts, debates, conversations, tragedies, and joys should be learned from and acted upon in the local scene rather than being written about for intellectual benefit of voyeuristic desires. Linda Tuhiwai Smith points out that the reporting back of indigenous research is not exclusively for academic frameworks. Some of my research is relevant for the Oroville community in its own evolution and self-understanding, but not for furthering a theoretical body of knowledge. Some, while interesting to highlight, as part of the theorization of experimental societies such as Orville, may have implications for the community that outweigh this intellectual benefit. There is also the question of what I choose to include and not only exclude as a citizen anthropologist. Angela Cheater highlights that, by definition in the past, anthropologists have tended to accept their respondents' versions of local social reality. For the citizen anthropologist, however, there may be a real conflict between supporting such local versions of reality and his own understanding from a different perspective of the future outcome for his own society by supporting such views. It is absolutely the case that I also consider potential ramifications
implications of this research project for Orville in terms of what it could foster within the community. Such assessment is not only subjective, but inherently political. Exposing a reflexive ethnographic process allows for the situating of knowledge, which I consider to be more ethical and insightful for this autoethnographic research project than upholding a pretext of objectivity. Where I fall short of acknowledging my own biases and oversights, something I am especially wary of the potential for as an autoethnographer, I hope that the methodology itself will inherently afford readers the opportunity to become aware of mine. My personal PhD journey. I choose to share with you my personal journey as it relates to my undertaking this PhD for two reasons. First, doing so is in keeping with the reflexive, autoethnographic mode of inquiry I have embraced for this research. Much more significantly, the process which has led me to undertaking the PhD is deeply revelatory of the spiritual experiences of Aurovillians that reflect and inform our worldview. Linda Tuhiwai Smith affirms that native research has a mandate to ground itself in its own so-called alternative ontologies and epistemologies, ways of knowing, understanding, and interpreting ourselves and the world, and thereby honor these. Along the same lines, Angela Cheater states, continuing verities such as ethnicity and witchcraft cannot be handled as in Western textbooks, as if both teacher and student were non-believers. We are confronted here by the issue of equality, the necessity to afford the conceptual frameworks of one's fellow citizens not merely the status of rationality, as limited and closed systems that are ultimately wrong, but also that of an equal and alternative reality that affects oneself. Among the difficult academic arguments Indigenous scholars have to make, to E.Y. Smith underscores, is that Indigenous knowledge is a body of world knowledge that has a contribution to make in institutions and disciplines, in the face of the monoculturalism of Western institutions of knowledge that prevents the inclusion or consideration of other ways of knowing and understanding. I will not take on the task to make that argument here for the spiritual dimension of this autoethnographic research, but simply offer my experience as an affirmation of an insight into it. I was born in Oroville in May 1987. My parents, an English father and French mother, had both dropped out of university, moved to and met in Oroville in their 20s. I was among the first students to graduate from one of the community's grassroots high schools with the qualifications that would allow me to attend university anywhere in the world. And in 2007, I joined the University of Sussex as an undergraduate student in development studies and human geography. I performed well academically, but the experience was deeply dissatisfying and downright detrimental for my overall well-being. I didn't see the point in being walled in to learn, disconnected from the world we were supposedly studying. I missed the rich, deep, intergenerational and multicultural social fabric I had experienced in Oroville. The excitement of being immersed in an unbridled learning environment, as well as the space and support for spiritual development. After my first year, 
I filed for an intermission and never returned to complete my undergraduate degree at Sussex. Five years later, I was in the Bay Area and decided to visit UC Berkeley. Despite being sorely disenchanted with my first academic experience, the question of whether or not to go back to university had kept tormenting me. I figured if it kept coming up, there was something there that was unresolved, a very Orwellian way of looking at things. I also told myself that even if going back to university didn't turn out to be right for me, well, at least I would never ask myself the question again in my entire life, and that alone would be worth it. I really wasn't prepared for what I would experience that day. It was a casual visit, but it turned out to be one of those moments in life where all of a sudden I felt like I'd entered into another dimension. I felt the atmosphere change from the moment I set foot on the campus, in between two immense oak trees surrounded by ginormous squirrels. Even the fact that the squirrels were ginormous was somehow imbued with an incomprehensible magnitude of meaning, highly comical in retrospect. The first thing I remember feeling is that I felt like I was home. As I kept walking in, I started to connect to a matrix of great minds, their activity vibrationally palpable to me. I realized that I owed it to myself to pursue a university education, and I was convinced it was meant to be at UC Berkeley. The university is notoriously difficult to get into, but I never dwelled on that. It was either meant to be or it wasn't. I actually felt like it was already done energetically, and over the next year, like I was just going through the exercise of jumping through all the required hoops. I got in with a full scholarship, and in my first meeting with my thesis supervisor, he broke the ice by asking me a seemingly innocent question, after struggling to pronounce my unusual name. So, where are you from? I responded tentatively with a one-liner about being brought up in Oroville. Bob was fascinated. He kept asking questions, from personal ones like, how did your parents meet? To general ones like, what form of governance do you practice? After about 40 minutes of this, I started glancing apologetically through the doorway to the other students who were waiting, each of us scheduled for 10 minute slots. Well, he concluded, this is what you will write your thesis on. I was flabbergasted. I could do academic research on Oroville, on my own home. Is that a legitimate thesis topic? I asked to assure myself I had heard him correctly. Of course, he said, his eyes earnest behind big bushy eyebrows. It's a PhD. I was a little overwhelmed. I didn't quite take him seriously. Only once, when I was applying for an honors award for the thesis, on his recommendation, did Bob's confidence falter. This is not a usual topic, he said. I don't know how it will be received. Very well, it turned out. My thesis was awarded highest honors by the department and several professors pulled me aside, advising me to take this work into a PhD. I was even shortlisted for graduating valedictorian. But my first priority was returning to Oroville. I was tired of being away. I needed to reconnect with my spiritual home and community and then feel into whether the PhD was what I felt called to do. Another very Orovillian practice of personal decision-making. As part of that exploration, I worked on a couple of research projects, one on Portus Distribution Center, Oroville's communal cooperative, and one on education in Oroville. I found these incredibly enriching as they involved deep conversations with fellow Orovillians, in which I asked questions 
I would not have occasion to otherwise, leading to insight into my peers' innermost aspirations and experiences. This put me into contact with and revealed to me the shared underlying spiritual dimensions that individuals draw from in their everyday life and that fuels our community. I felt more than once a profound sense of connection with the mother, Orville's founder, when I sat down to my desk to write up my research, a feeling that she was guiding me to do this work something I had never experienced before and that so many Orvillians spoke of. I resented at some level that the obvious next step was to do a PhD on Oroville. I didn't want to leave my friends, partner, family, forest walks, community living, spiritual home again. I had just returned after years of intending to. It felt unfair. And I also didn't think of a PhD as a useful endeavor at all. What would four additional years of academic pursuit concretely offer the world? But there was an undeniable feeling that I was being called to, and inexplicably that I was being directed to by the mother. I decided to surrender to that, albeit uncomfortably. Surrendering to the Divine Consciousness, in this case, personified as the Mother, is a key practice of Integral Yoga. It has none of the connotations of passivity that we would associate with the word surrender in a Western understanding. Being exercised within a spiritual discipline of action or work, Karma Yoga. Karma Yoga is one of the three paths of yoga, according to Vedic scripture. It is elucidated in the Bhagavad Gita, a foundational text for Sri Aurobindo's philosophy and practice, on which he commented extensively. Essentially, the path of Karma Yoga involves carrying out the work we are being asked to do by the Divine, even if there is something else we could do better or feel better about, as an act of service and in a spirit of offering to the Divine, and without being attached to the fruits of our action. In our contemporary, predominantly results-driven, westernized global culture, in which education, higher in particular, is primarily approached instrumentally, guiding one's life's choices in this way is difficult for most to comprehend. When people ask me why I'm doing this PhD and I tell them it's because I feel I'm meant to, it leaves the vast majority perplexed. As though I hadn't understood the question, some try to reframe it. It's so much work, what are you hoping to get out of it? Become a professor? I smile knowing it's hard to really explain to someone who has no reference points for it. But I try again, reframing the answer. I'm not doing it for what comes after. I might do something completely different after. I'm doing it now because it's what I feel I'm meant to do. The Autoethnographic Challenge to Self-Understanding Autoethnography is reputed to be a uniquely demanding and trying methodology prone to difficult self-questioning. Research on one's own community may challenge foundational self-understandings of both self and community and reframe the nature of the researcher's relationship with their community. The practice of being reflexive throughout the course of one's research can also be a strenuous process, psychologically and emotionally. I was in some ways primed for this because both introspection and a questioning of established social practices forms part of the Oravillian culture. 
self-awareness and self-exploration is embedded in the process of integral yoga, and the tools and inclination for doing so were nurtured in our Oroville education and upbringing. Along with the culture of adopting a broad view of situations, based on the understanding that an evolutionary process of consciousness is one that is uneven, sometimes seemingly contradictory, conflictual, and challenging at both individual and collective levels, this created a basis from which I was able to maintain, or at least return to, a centered, non-reactive, and peaceful state. This helped me to weather the fieldwork process and to access a subjective objectivity. The biggest challenge I could have faced at a personal level from undertaking research on Oroville was being confronted with realities within our community that violated my understanding of it and were previously unknown to me. Thankfully, I had already largely undergone the brunt of this process, having returned to the community prior, at 28, after having lived abroad for almost a decade. While I had visited the community several times during this period, I had never become engaged in it as an adult. I was not working within the community in any kind of capacity. Thus I had been, to a large extent, blissfully unaware of the challenges inherent in creating and maintaining the social world I benefited from immersing and imbuing myself within during my stays, just like during my childhood. Every visit to Orville during the period in which I lived outside of it was an experience of deep spiritual, energetic, physical and emotional recharge given the pervasive spiritual atmosphere and nurturing web of relationships, family, friends, teachers, and other unknown community members with whom one feels a connection simply through their openness and presence. However, as soon as I became involved in community projects and an initial work of research, I was confronted with attitudes and practices that challenged my expectation of ours being a community of conscious individuals with a shared ideal of human unity. This was no easy process, and one that is shared by other returnees and those newly joining the community. It is probably inevitable for the unseasoned idealist, and a trapping of any project with utopian aspirations. I had thus already undergone a process of being destabilized in my self-understanding of our community before undertaking the PhD, and I had also been able to ground myself into a deeper, more mature and more centered understanding of it. As a result, I was experientially, and not just intellectually, prepared for such challenges to arise in the course of my doctoral fieldwork, which they did. There was one particular group whose meetings I attended, in which I found myself shocked by the gap between my understanding of the ideals of the community as pertained to their field of work, and the attitudes, values, and contents of their discussions. I found it very challenging to attend these meetings. I was too identified with my expectations of what such conversations should be centered on and entail, and with what tone, to bear witness to them with detachment and not be unhealthily affected. On the other hand, there was another group by which I was unexpectedly positively surprised, having had misplaced preconceptions. Personal Empowerment or ethnography at home. Another level of challenge of autoethnography is that the collapsing of home and field 
makes for all-consuming fieldwork. In my case, my personal life was largely overtaken by the research process and transformed by it. Like my fellow autoethnographer, Leila Volodar, quote, I found that not only did my circle of family, friends, and relatives encroach into research territory, but that maintaining artificial boundaries between my everyday life and research was proving counterproductive and a betrayal of the highly entangled web of relationships of which I was a part. I was a fully engaged member of the social world under the study, and with this came the recognition that my research could be enriched by this closeness." Close quote. Furthermore, ethnographic participant observation propelled an intensification of my participation in community life, which included engaging in spheres and practices that I had never had previously, from governance to singing with the Orville Choir. While challenging in its intensity, I thought of myself as living one and a half lives during fieldwork. The collapsing of home and field was enriching for me in countless significant ways, research outcomes aside. It sparked deeply insightful and revelatory conversations with friends, family, and acquaintances that may never have been broached otherwise. The process of research uncovered histories of my parents' engagement within the community that I was utterly unaware of. A question I asked them at a Sunday family lunch on Common Accounts in Oroville led me to discover that they had started the first Common Account. I embarked on research on Oroville's service economy only to discover that my mother had been one of its chief architects. As she was a member of several key economic working groups that I was sitting on during the course of my fieldwork, I came to spend many a meeting in her company, in a capacity in which she was previously entirely unknown to me. As a result, we have collaborated on proposals for economic policy, effecting a translation of my work into action research. Generally speaking, I would say that the knowledge I gained about Oroville, relationships I built, and insights gleaned as a result of the research process significantly empowered me as a community member. Those ethnographers who advocate for reflexivity maintain that it is imperative to do so because it serves to situate knowledge and that this serves a fundamentally ethical function. I found that my autoethnographic endeavor allowed me to situate myself in a reflexive and evolving process in relationship to my community. Because I have developed my capacity to situate my personal experiences in light of a bigger picture, I am much better able to position myself within Oroville in an intentional and ethical way, in light of its ideals. Stella Mascarenhas' case speaks of how a native anthropologist has to become a multiple native, transcending her own pre-existing personal relationship with the community in order to relate with a broader spectrum of community members. This can be challenging, especially in a small community setting like Oroville, where simply engaging with certain groups or individuals is likely to be read as alliance and the implications this may have for one's ongoing personal, social, and professional relationships, which are more often than not intertwined. Stella says she wished for an outward sign, such as a large badge, saying, I am an anthropologist, and therefore should be granted diplomatic immunity. For me, being compelled to become a multiple native was primarily an interesting experience in overcoming what were often unconsciously inherited perceptions about others within the community 
and even led to the formation of new relationships. Chang has highlighted that among the singular benefits of the autoethnographic mode are increasing sensitivity towards the experiences, positionality, and needs of others, potentially even correcting misunderstandings and misperceptions that might be blocking effective responsiveness to communal and interpersonal challenges. This was, to a certain extent, an outcome of a prior autoethnographic research project on Orville, and I humbly aspire that this doctoral research will yield such benefits as well, and with greater scope. Linda Tuhiwai Smith contrasts Western academia, dominated by critique, with contemporary indigenous research, whose key mode is community-based action projects and initiatives. While I am a white European and not an indigenous person, as a researcher member of Orville, much of my field research almost perforce became action research due to my investment in the community as a member and the trust and familiarity that other community members, including ones that did not know me personally, bestowed on me as a result which led them to invite me to merge my research with their activism as a result. The awarding of trust and familiarity is a phenomenon that Leila Volodur, another young autoethnographer, also experienced in her fieldwork, in which she specifically attributed to her being a young, second-generation member of the community. My identity as an Orville kid, one ascribed to anyone born or raised in Orville, whatever their current age might be, and its associated embeddedness in the communal web of relationships, resulted not only in this inherited trust and familiarity, but also in an enthusiasm from an older generation of community members to involve me in processes particularly of governance, as an investment in the future of Oroville. Something compounded by a perceived lack of interest from young Orvillians in the political realm of community life. Thus, my participant observation in the selection process of Oroville's major working groups led the Oroville Council to invite me to join them as a resource person for its review and amendment. My participant observation in Orville's economic governance groups led to my consulting on initiatives presented to the community as part of the Funds and Assets Management Committee's Growing Orville's Economy Sustainably call for new economic proposals for the community in November 2018. Most importantly, however, in terms of a community-based action project emerging from our research, was The Bridge, a conference project I led for Orville's 50th anniversary, which involved taking a new level of responsibility and engagement within the community. Had I not been engaged in research on and in Oroville, I would not have envisioned such an event. It was precisely because my study of Oroville highlighted its underserved potential as a site of research that I came to do so, inspired by our community's charter, which states that Oroville will be a site of material and spiritual researches for a living embodiment of an actual human unity. An academic research project thus empowered my participation in an active initiative in the community that sought to put its ideals into practice, the very phenomenon that my doctoral research seeks to investigate. Even more significant, however, may be the fact that undertaking this doctoral research itself was a significant experience of coming of age as an Oravillian, given that it was revelatory of the practice of karma yoga in the Oroville context as described earlier in this chapter. 
the autoethnographic research process has offered me unique opportunities to engage in, relate to, embody, and understand Oroville as a community and a project from within. Before delving into my theoretical conceptualization and ethnographic exploration of Oroville, informed by the latter, in the next chapter, I consider it from without, in the broader historical context and literature of intentional communities.